we are back with the fourth module of our MOOCs course, where we are discussing about chain reactions in reactors. Of course, we already had two lectures on this and from there hopefully you have understood the importance of chain reaction. So, just a part of the recap for whatever we have covered in the earlier two lectures. Uh, you have so far understood that whenever there is a fission reaction that generally produces neutrons. Now, the number of neutrons produced from each fission may vary uh, between 1 to 7, but commonly it is 2 or 3. Uh, but uh, just one fission itself is not sufficient, rather we need to have a chain of such fission reactions. And in this particular context, we can uh, connect this particular module with the previous two modules as well. Like in module 2, you have understood while discussing about the artificial radioactivity, you have learned that we can induce radioactive decay to any nucleus by striking it with a suitably charged particle and the choice for that particle is generally a neutron. But uh, what will be the nature of such kind of neutron nucleus collision that generally depends upon both the energy level of the neutron as well as the property of the nucleus itself. And from our third module we have learned that uh, about uh, out of several possible kinds of interactions fission is just one of them and only very few nucleus like uranium 233 or 235 or plutonium 239, they have some kind of uh, significant fission cross section, so that they can undergo fission reaction when being struck by a thermal neutron. Uranium 238 has a small uh, first fission, uh, fission cross section when it is subjected to first neutrons, but generally most of the common nucleus do not have any fission cross section at all. Now, when so uh, we understand a or we identify a particle as a nuclear fuel only when that is, has, that is having some kind of fission cross section. And just inducing a fission by striking the nucleus with a uh, neutron itself is not sufficient, rather the neutrons which are being produced by that fission at least one of them should induce fission to the neighboring nucleus, then only we can have a chain of reactions. Such kind of chain reaction is quantified in terms of the multiplication factor and reactivity, where uh, this is their relation which we have already learned. Uh, a reactor which is having a multiplication factor of 1 and reactivity of 0 is called a critical reactor, where for every fission reaction only one pro neutron that is produced from the fission is allowed to participate in a subsequent reaction. And uh, accordingly the rate of fission reaction remains constant so that the reactor is able to produce a constant amount of power over a long period of time. When uh, more than one neutrons are participating in the subsequent fission reaction, we call that a supercritical reactor. Here the multiplication factor is greater than 1 and reactivity is positive, whereas for a subcritical reactor, multiplication factor is less than 1. You can somehow relate this process of chain reaction to the cell division that happens in our bodies. Like in a uh, healthy human body, there are always some new cells that are getting produced because of cell division. Similarly, some cells are also dying because of aging issues or maybe some other relevant factors. Now, in a healthy uh, fully grown up body, generally the number of such cells produced because of division is uh, balanced by the number of cells that are dying and accordingly total number of cells remains more or less the same. That you can relate to a critical reactor. Whereas, a supercritical reactor is uh, can somehow resemble uh, the situation with a tumor or with a cancerous tumor. There the cell division is uncontrolled, so that the number of cells in that particular tissue that keeps on increasing at a rapid rate and uh, that is not at all uh, being balanced by the uh, death of the cells. Accordingly, total number of cells keeps on increasing. Similarly, a supercritical reactor also will show uh, increase a sharp increase in the rate of fission reaction and hence a diverging kind of uh, power production rate which we generally relate to nuclear weapons. But the most important factor in controlling this multiplication factor right like uh, commonly in power reactors we would like to have a multiplication factor of uh, 1 so that we can maintain a critical reactor and hence a constant power generation rate. But in certain situations we may have to increase the power production rate say so uh, we can uh, go for a supercritical situation or sometimes if we like to shut down the reactor or lower the power generation, we may go to the subcritical stage. But uh, controlling this reactivity is very important and the most important factor in that control is the role of neutrons. 
Therefore, in previous lectures we have discussed a lot about different factors associated with neutrons. We have discussed about neutron interaction uh, which is generally given by a relation like this and uh, we the mean free path uh, characterizes the distance average distance traveled by a neutron between uh, two successive interactions or which uh, is can be uh, related directly to the corresponding cross sections. And then we went to the studying the neutron diffusion theory. And the Fick's law was introduced which governs the diffusion of neutrons in a particular medium and uh, using that we can get a balance in the number of neutrons present in a present in a medium that is the total the change in the number of neutrons present in the medium can be related to the the rate of growth and the rate of absorption and also the rate of leakage accordingly we got this one this is a single energy group or single group neutron diffusion equation here this uh, d is the diffusion coefficient sigma is the absorption cross section s is a source term the source of neutron and v is the velocity of the neutron so if we are uh, dealing with a critical reactor okay that we can come just after some time this equation can be modified to a form like this where we have these two new terms these which are called buckling b g square is called the geometrical buckling as it is generally a function of the geometry whereas b m square is called the material buckling as it is related to the material properties. And when the we are operating with a critical reactor then the neutron flux that is this phi that remains constant to time hence this term goes to 0 and therefore, for a critical reactor we have this particular condition satisfied that is B g square is equal to B m square. So, uh, this part up to this part that is uh, till the previous lecture we have discussed about or we have developed this neutron balance equation and we have discussed about the neutron diffusion theory. So, today we shall be utilizing this equation to study the neutron flux that we may encounter in a particular given kind of reactor in a given geometry and uh, subsequently we would like to use that in design of different reactors. So, uh, let us take three different sample problems and our objective is to or three different sample geometries I should say our objective is to identify the distribution of neutron flux for a critical reactor in each of such configurations. And uh, I am actually not sure how much time the subsequent slides are going to take place because here we are having lots of mathematics uh, to consider. Had it been a normal class where I am dealing with a chalk and board, uh, it could have taken uh, much more than a single lecture, but here as everything I am having on the slides it may go through very quickly. But still let us start this. The first geometry we have is that of an infinite planar source. Like our geometry is that of a plane uh, which is acting as a source of neutron and it is having uh, nearly 0 thickness or extremely small thickness. Look at this diagram here this by this dark color we have the plate shown here we can take uh, this particular coordinate system x in this direction that is normal to the plane and uh, these are the other through coordinate systems. Now, uh, here our uh, geometry or our problem definition is the dimension of the plate in the y and z direction is infinitely large. That is the length scale that we have in the y and z direction are much much larger compared to that in the x direction or we can write if L x refers to the length scale in the x direction is uh, much much smaller than length scale in the y direction and a length scale in the z direction. And hence subsequently we can write the gradient in the x direction gradient for any quantity that has to be significantly larger compared to the gradient in the y and gradient in the z direction and hence uh, gradient of any quantity in the y and z direction can be neglected reducing this to a one dimensional problem where we can uh, safely consider all variations to be taking place only in the x direction that is uh, perpendicular to this particular plate. Here we have taken our coordinate system to be at the center line of this plane and uh, the thickness as I have already mentioned the thickness of the sources can be considered to be negligibly small. So, uh, this is the 
standard form of for a for the diffusion equation which we have already studied in the previous lecture and also mentioned in the previous slide under steady state the transient term goes to 0 and so we have the three terms where this is the rate of absorption where uh, this is the rate of absorption this is the um, generation related term or I should say I should not say generation rather this is the neutron diffusion or leakage uh, where we have used the fixed law of diffusion and this is is the generation from some external source or neutrons supplied to the system from some external source. So, here we are not at all considering a kind of fission reaction rather you can think about that this uh, in that this plate or the uh, planar source of neutron that is immersed into an infinite stretch of diffusing medium where we do not have any fission reaction happening. Therefore, only thing that the neutron can uh, encounter is diffusion and also absorption by the medium which is surrounding this plate. So, uh, the there is no other source of neutron away from the plate only source is present that is at the center of this coordinate system that is at x equal to 0. That means, at this particular condition location we have some kind of neutron source, but which are moving away from the plate there is no neutron source. Therefore, uh, a small distance away from this neutron uh, source or this plane, we can neglect this term s uh, to and uh, accordingly this equation simplifies to this. Now, sigma a by d as per our earlier definition is the reciprocal of l square l being the diffusion length. So, uh, this uh, here we are using the Cartesian coordinate system uh, as that is the most suitable one to this geometry. Accordingly, we have uh, d 2 psi d x 2 is equal to 1 by l square into phi which is a very very standard second order differential equation and we know the solution is going to be of this particular form that is it is going to be a summation of two exponential terms a 1 and a 2 are two constants whose values we have to identify using the boundary conditions. Now, you see that the neutron flux phi is given as a summation of two exponential terms and both of them are functions of x here l is the diffusion length here one ex the first exponential term is a decaying one, whereas the second exponential term is a growing one. That is as we are moving away from the plate, while the first term will uh, start to diminish, the second term will keep on growing. Uh, but uh, that is uh, not a very feasible uh, situation to have, because we can always expect as we are moving away from the plate, corresponding neutron flux that should decrease uh, with x and that is possible only when the second term is absent in this and hence this a 2 has to be 0. So, we are having this single coefficient a 1 that we need to evaluate using the boundary condition. Now, what can be the boundary condition? This is the simple form that we have, but uh, what can be the boundary condition that we need to use? Here look at the center line or the dotted vertical line this particular line that is uh, that is shown in this in this problem. This refers to the at x equal to 0 we have the source and as we are moving away from this the effect of source uh, gets negated or rather I should say the effect of source can be eliminated. But at the center line that is at x equal to 0 location the source is present which is uh, continuously emitting neutron following some kind of pattern and this neutron flux or corresponding neutron current density at the center x equal to 0 should be equal to the strength of the source. Now, let us consider S double prime as the uh, source strength per unit area of the plate that is the plate is emitting neutrons at a rate of S double prime neutrons per unit area per meter square say for the plate. So, this uh, source strength S double prime or this uh, neutron emission per unit area should be equal to the neutron current density at the center line uh, that is uh, limit x 2 to 0 j x should be equal to s double prime by 2. Why this by 2 is coming into picture? Because you have to consider that uh, s double prime is the uh, strength of the source, but it is equally emitting in both a positive x and negative x direction. And therefore, uh, the positive x direction which we are considering here is receiving only s double prime by 2 or half of that amount. So, the neutron current density at x equal to 0 location should be equal to s double prime by 2. And use from fixed law of diffusion we know that j x is equal to minus d d phi d x. So, here we can uh, put this particular form of phi that is we can differentiate this form of phi and put it back here. So, we are uh, getting this thing and uh, now putting this limit extends to 0 
we get a 1 to be equal to this particular form is double prime to L by 2 D. Hence, this is the final form of this neutron flux distribution in this uh, infinite stretch of diffuse medium that we are having that which is surrounding this planar source. Here we are putting x mod of x because this particular distribution is true on either side of this plate that is for both positive x and negative x this distribution, this distribution is true or you can uh, say that um, the distribution uh, is uh, on one side of this dotted line is a mirror image of that on the other side. Uh, corresponding distribution is also shown by the dotted line also shown by this is the distribution which is already shown here. Now, this is the situation of a very simple geometry of an infinite planar source. Now, you move to our second problem where we basically have a point source and it is a single point which is emitting neutrons in all possible directions surrounding this and similar to the previous problem here this point is also immersed into an infinite stretch of diffusing medium, but there is no fission going on around. This being a point it uh, can emit in all possible directions of a sphere around this and uh, particularly when this source is an isotropic one then its intensity of emission in all possible directions should be equal and hence instead of Cartesian coordinate we have to take the spherical coordinate while solving this. So, again uh, at a reasonable distance away from the source the uh, presence of the source can be neglected. So, this is a simple equation, but here while expressing this Laplacian we have to use the cylindrical coordinate system and the sphere being or the source being isotropic we can uh, consider this again to be a one dimensional problem because whatever variation in the flux is taking place that is only in the r direction, but the uh, other two directions that is theta and z coordinates are not having any influence or rather neutron distribution is symmetric with respect to both of them. Hence, uh, we are having uh, this particular form. Now, this is a slightly complicated equation compared to the previous one. So, we use one substitution where we define a term psi as the product of r and phi. So, if we put it back into this original equation, then we get this particular form d 2 psi d r this should be d 2 psi d r 2 minus uh, psi upon L square. So, uh, this equation again is very similar to the one that we have got in the previous slide. So, homogeneous equation having a very standard solution uh, like this uh, a 1 upon r into exponential minus r by L plus a 2 upon r into exponential r by L. Uh, now, what should be the corresponding boundary condition that we must use here? again as we are moving away from the source we are seeing that the flask phi is a summation of two exponential term one decaying with r and other growing with r, but as we are moving away from the source the neutron flux should decay and hence this a 2 should go to 0 leaving only this negative exponential term. So, we have to identify only a single coefficient that is a 1 here. How can we identify that? We have to consider that the neutron current density at the center that is at r equal to 0 multiplied by the area should be equal to the strength of the source. If the source strength is s it is not s double prime it is just strength that is the source that point source is emitting s number of neutrons per unit time. Then and the neutron current density j r multiplied by the area of the sphere of radius r which is 4 pi r square should be equal to this s. because uh, whenever whatever may be the value of this r, but what the number of neutrons emitted by the source that must pass through the entire surface of this particular sphere which is given by this a, uh, 4 pi r square and multiplying that with the current density uh, or neutron current density we are getting that to be equal to s at r equal to 0. So, we put the fixed law of diffusion where j becomes d d phi d r this particular contribution and uh, this phi can be replaced with this particular term. So, we get a 1 is equal to s upon 4 pi d and this is the distribution of flux in the radial direction. So, uh, for both these two problems of an infinite planar source and for a point source we can uh, just following the standard methodology stand of solving any differential equation or in a differential equation we can calculate the final form of flux distribution. 
it is uh, quite straightforward it shows that as we r keeps on increasing uh, this as r keeps on increasing this flux density also keeps on reducing exponentially uh, following this particular trend that is uh, when r tends to infinity this should be equal to 0. We have a third problem to deal with that is of a line source. Here our source or neutron source is like a line which is having 0 thickness, but it is having certain length may be in you can consider this line strength to be infinite. This being a line it can emit again uh, neutrons in all possible directions around this and hence the neutrons coming out of this should pass through a cylindrical surface just like that shown here. So, following the similar methodology this is the governing equation, but here we should use the cylindrical coordinate system. So, this is the form this uh, 1 upon r d dr of r d phi dr minus phi upon l, l square is equal to 0. And now, we uh, just play around this that is we break the first differential and then uh, get a form like and multiply everything with r square to get a form like this. It is a quite complicated form actually, but actually the kind of equations that we are having here that is known as the Bessel's equation which has a very standard solution. Uh, I hope most of you are aware about Bessel functions or modified Bessel functions. If you are not, you please go to any standard mathematics book and you will find uh, this form for a Bessel function or Bessel equation which is a form like this, uh, which also has a very standard solution given by Bessel functions or modified Bessel functions and corresponding solutions will be like this. Here I naught is the modified Bessel function of first kind and K naught is a modified Bessel function of the second kind. Both of them are periodic functions and they have a very standard form which I do not want to repeat here. But the graphical representations are like this. Here actually uh, I naught and K naught refers to only the 0th mode, they can have several modes like uh, shown in the graph on the left. Here I naught is having a certain kind of form which you can check from mathematics books that it keeps on increasing exponentially with x, whereas K naught keeps on decreasing exponentially with x. Now, we know that uh, x or you can say r in this particular coordinate system. Now, as r keeps on increasing neutron flux intensity or um, the current density should reduce with time and hence this i naught should not have any contribution or rather this a 2 should go to 0 leaving only one term. And uh, now to evaluate this particular constant a 1 we have to use a condition similar to the previous slide we are assuming a source strength of s. The neutron current in density multiplied by the area of an uh, of a cylinder should be equal to the source strength. So, at a distance r from the source or assuming a cylinder of radius r and of height small l, this is the corresponding area of the cylinder is 2 pi r l or surface area multiplied by the current density should be equal to s. The I am not showing the detailed calculation you can follow similar procedure because again j can be related to the gradient of phi following the fixed law and uh, this k naught itself is a function of r. So, if we put them you are going to get that a 1 is equal to s prime by 2 pi d where this s prime is actually source strength per unit length s by small l. So, final form of the flux is something like this. Hence, you can see here that we have always started with the the diffusion equation for neutrons, but we have dealt with three different kinds of problems, three different kinds of geometries. Each of them demands a separate kind of coordinate system adoption, but uh, following the standard procedure we have always, uh, we are always able to uh, get a simplified expression for the final uh, flux distribution form. And this exercise also allows us to get a realistic idea or a physical interpretation of the diffusion length. Let us go back to the second problem, where we had a point source here this uh, red dot represents that point source, which is emitting neutrons isotropically in all possible directions over a sphere around this. Now, we consider a spherical shell around this, the inner radius of the shell is r and thickness is dr. Then the total number of neutrons that are getting absorbed per unit time within this shell should be equal to the absorption cross section of the shell material 
into the neutron flux at that particular location into the volume of the shell here dv refers to the volume of this infinitesimal uh, shell and uh, what is dv that is 4 pi r square into dr if dr is extremely small compared to r we can always represent dv with 4 pi r square into dr what about phi phi you have already solved for in the earlier slides the solution of phi is already available so you can put this directly here and we can now simplify this that is uh, from this expressions this r and uh, r square cancels out and 4 pi also goes out leaving us uh, s into r in the numerator and d upon sigma a is equal to l square so we are having this uh, dn that is change in the number of neutrons so neutrons getting absorbed is equal to s upon l square into exponential of minus r by l into r dr and now if we want to know the probability of neutron absorption in this shell the probability is p r dr has to be is equal to d n upon s because s is the total number of neutrons that are getting emitted from the source and d n is the number of neutrons that is getting absorbed in this. So, its probability is the number of neutron absorption per unit uh, for every neutron uh, emitted by the source that is d n upon s and putting the expression for d n it is r upon l square into exponential minus r by l dr. So, now we need to calculate the uh, distance travelled by neutron the straight line distance travelled by neutron from the source to the point of its absorption. Uh, but uh, I do not know why in fact I have not found any proper explanation in the books also that is uh, common uh, neutron science does not use the distance rather uh, they use the square of this distance or I should say the mean square of the distance travelled by the neutron from its birth place to the place of absorption and uh, that capital R refers to this uh, straight line distance and uh, R square is the square of that. So, the taking the mean of that square distance that should be equal to integral 0 to infinity R square P R dr as uh, R can be of any value from 0 to infinite and here if you put the expression from this particular expression for P R dr you are going to get this to be equal to 6 L square. That means, the mean square of the distance travelled by a neutron can directly be related with the diffusion length or on other words the diffusion length is a representative of the straight line distance travelled by a neutron average straight line distance travelled by a neutron from uh, the source to the location where it gets absorbed. And hence if we have some idea about this uh, diffusion length we can always calculate this distance travelled by the neutron. Uh, but you should, should not co get confused with the earlier the earlier defined term uh, mean free path. Mean free path is the total distance travelled by neutron between two successive interactions, but here this r talks about only the straight line distance. Like generally the movement or passage of neutron in the reactor is quite zigzag, it can move from somewhat like this, but this r is actually the straight line distance only from, from its source to the strength that is it will start from this point and finish up at this point and only comprise a straight line between this. So, this uh, distance r is uh, invariably much smaller than the mean free path. But what we can see is that the diffusion length is typically only about 0.4 times of the distance uh, travelled by the neutron from its birth place to the point of absorption on an average. If we do the same exercise for a for the infinite planar source then there you would have got r square bar is equal to to L square. I would urge you to try this for just follow the same procedure on a Cartesian coordinate system and you should get r bar square is equal to twice of L square. So, by knowing the diffusion length we can get a proper idea about the distance travelled by the neutron. Now, we enter the situation of multiplying environment like the three problems that we have discussed so far there we have considered the neighboring medium or surrounding medium. Uh, not to have any kind of fissionable nuclei, but when uh, in a typical nuclear reactor we may have fissionable nuclei present as well. Like the neutron may get diffuse uh, through the moderator, but immediately after the moderator or sometimes mixed with the moderator itself we may have fuel nuclei. And uh, whenever there is a fuel nuclei that is being acted upon by the neutron we can have additional fission reaction and those fission reactions will produce some further neutrons or will add some further neutrons into the system. <coughs> that is what we refer to as the multiplying environment. 
Corresponding time dependent conservation equation or time independent I should say conservation equation that is for a critical reactor this equation is like this. Here you can see the three terms are the same like in the previous case we have the absorption term, we have the leakage term related to the fixed law of diffusion and we have the source term the external source. But we also have an additional term in between which represents the rate of neutron production because of fission. Here just as per our previous terminology new refers to the number of neutrons average number of neutrons produced for fission sigma f refers to the fission cross section and uh, phi is the neutron flux. Uh, if the neutron source is absent then uh, this s goes off and then we uh, uh, we can rewrite this equation to a form like this minus 1 by phi d 2 phi or the Laplacian of phi should be equal to nu sigma f minus sigma a upon d or if you remember our earlier definition this particular term is referred to as the geometrical buckling b g square. So, that comes out to be nu into sigma f minus sigma a by d that is by knowing the properties of the medium we can get some idea about this geometrical the geometrical buckling as well. For a critical reactor we know that b g square is equal to b m square is equal to b square. Uh, so, we now have to apply this multi equation diffusion equation in multiplying environment to have more realistic neutron uh, distribution in reactors. But before that we have to remember a few, a few assumptions like uh, reactor material is uh, assumed to be homogeneous and uh, is having uniform properties in all directions and uh, the reactor is working under steady state that is it is a critical reactor and total number of neutrons remains constant with time as are any other parameters. And uh, third assumption all neutrons belong to the same energy level remember what we are doing here is uh, the solution of a single energy diffusion equation uh, that where all neutrons are assumed to have more or less the same energy level, but the variation in the neutron energy level has been neglected. So, we assume all neutrons to belong to the same energy level that is um, have identical velocities or identical kinetic energies. So, with that let us try to study a few reactor designs. The first reactor that we have is for an infinite slab. Here our reactor you can think this to be an extension of that infinite source problem or infinite plane source that we have uh, discussed shortly back. Here your source is also an infinite slab reactor. Here your reactor is uh, it is an extension of the previous infinite uh, planar source problem that is uh, the reactor is of the shape of an infinite slab or its extent is infinity in the y and z direction, but it is having some kind of finite width in the x direction. So, the total reactor is having a width of a that is uh, from the central line to the edge the distance is a by 2 on either side of this and uh, again the dimensions in the y and z directions to be much significantly larger than the dimension in the x direction which is a or a by 2. Any variation in the y or z direction can be neglected and we are having variations to consider only in the x directions. So, this is the equation that we have just derived in the previous slide d 2 phi d x 2 plus v square phi is equal to 0 where b is the buckling parameter which is for a crit as we are assuming a critical reactor. So, b g square and b m square are equal and that is given by this b square. And again it is very standard homogeneous equation. So, corresponding solution will be a 1 cos b x plus a 2 sin b x. a 1 and a 2 are the two constants which we have to evaluate using the boundary conditions. So, what can be the possible boundary conditions? At x equal to 0 what can be the boundary condition? x equal to 0 refers to the central line and uh, given the geometry we can easily say that the uh, geometry is uh, a mirror image or one side of the geometry one side of the central line is a mirror image of the other side accordingly the central line can be considered to be a plane of symmetry and hence d phi d x has to be equal to 0. Another way of writing the same g boundary condition is phi at plus x should be equal to phi at minus x. Solution point of view sometimes this is uh, much better to write in this particular fashion. Another boundary condition that we should consider that is at the edge of the reactor that is x equal to plus a y 2 or minus a y 2. So, 
here uh, we take phi equal to 0 because as the neutrons are going out of the reactor. So, we do not expect any neutrons to exist outside the reactor. If we uh, put these two boundary conditions particularly if we put the first one that is we uh, differentiate this uh, equation d phi d x and put the limit x equal to 0 and equate that to 0 then we get this a 2 has to be equal to 0 because uh, the differentiator from what we are going to get by differentiation d phi d x has to be equal to b a 1 sin b x minus of that plus b a 2 cos b x. Now, if you put the limit x equal to 0 of course, sin 0 goes to 0, but uh, as per our definition d phi d x is equal to 0 at x equal to 0, but cos 0 is not 0 and it is possible only if either b or a 2 is equal to 0 b being on the buckling parameter it also is a non zero per number and hence a 2 has to be 0 to get a proper solution. Now, we apply the boundary condition at the edge of the reactor and hence uh, putting x equal to a by 2 plus a by 2 we get a 1 cos b into a by 2 is equal to 0, but in order to ensure a non trivial solution a 1 cannot be equal to 0 and hence cos b by a 2 has to be equal to 0 or in a way b y a 2 has to be equal to 2 n plus 1 to pi by 2 where n is 0 and any other integer or we can say b n can be equal to 2 n plus 1 into pi upon a like depending upon the value of n we can have a different values for this b n. So, this actually is leading to an infinite solution uh, the that is we are getting phi is equal to a n cos 2 n plus 1 pi x upon a where a n refers to the value of this coefficient a corresponds to the nth mode of this function. Uh, practically speaking uh, all the modes other than when the reactor is critical after uh, a certain period of time you will not find the existence of the other modes that is all the other harmonics for corresponding to n equal to 1, 2, 3 etcetera all will die down quite quickly and after some small period of time you will only see the a equal n equal to 0 that is the 0 th order eigen function of the corresponding fundamental eigen function that is existing and the magnitude of the other eigen functions being negligible. And hence for a critical slab reactor our solution is like this phi x is equal to a naught cos b naught x uh, or that is equal to a naught into cos pi x upon a, a being the half width of the reactor. But one important condition that we have to consider here, here we have taken this phi to be equal to 0 at the edge of the reactor, but practically that is not true. Just look at the diagram, practically we get a profile somewhat like this, that is phi uh, decreases initially from as we are moving away from the center line phi is decreasing, but uh, uh, while it uh, decreases following more or less the same gradient as per the diffusion theory, it changes quite sharply in the actual case, but uh, remaining constant once we are crossing that neutron level or cos once we are coming out of the reactor, but uh, just think about the following the diffusion theory at x equal to 0 at this particular location uh, this is not x equal to 0 I should say x equal to a at this location there is certain gradient that is being followed by this neutron flux. So, if we just extend that and uh, we shall we are reaching somewhere here that is if the neutron flux is allowed to follow the same trend after coming out of the reactor that would reach 0 at this particular location. This particular distance is often called the extrapolated length which is d and corresponding boundary condition is generally called the vacuum boundary condition. So, if uh, for most of the practical reactor problem this extrapolated length is uh, negligible and hence during calculation it can be neglected and the neutron flux can be assumed to approach 0 at the edge of the reactor itself. But if d is not not uh, negligible then in all the previous calculations like in the previous slide this a by 2 has to be replaced by a by 2 plus d and uh, solution of one group diffusion equation is solution which is beyond this course. Uh, for this kind of situation in a weakly absorbing homogeneous media we can find that d is equal to 0.71 into the transport mean free path or it is just 0.7104 into 3 times the diffusion length because we know that the transport mean free path 
is equal to 1 upon 3 d. These are certain values for common moderating materials like you can clearly see the diffusion length is generally quite small starting from point uh, 142 to in um, common water to 0.84 and 0.916 in graphite correspondingly the value of this small d or this extra volatile length that also keeps on increasing it can be just about 0.3 centimeter in common water but can be nearly 2 centimeter in graphite but still even the largest dimension that we are talking about for diffusion length is only about 2 meter centimeter and when you talk about a reactor common dimensions of the reactors are generally much much larger compared to these values and hence for most of the practical cases this uh, information is uh, and this information can be neglected and the boundary condition can be considered to be phi equal to 0 at the edge of the reactor. But we also have another task click that is we have to calculate the value of the coefficients that we have discussed the coefficient a naught can be calculated by using the power produced by the reactor. Practically speaking if we do not consider or if you do not impose any other condition we cannot evaluate the value of a naught uh, rather uh, for every different values uh, of a naught we can have a different solution. So, total power produced by the reactor can be represented by this where this E refers to the energy released by every fission reaction into the absorption cross section into the neutron flask and this is being integrated from uh, minus a by 2 plus a by 2 that is from one edge of the reactor to the other edge of the reactor and uh, corresponding solution is this. So, if we proceed further we can get a naught to be equal to pi p naught by 2 e sigma f a here uh, again I repeat sigma f is the fission cross section p dot is the power produced by the reactor and e is the energy emitted by every fission reaction which is typically of the order of 200 MeV. So, putting this uh, back in the previous expression we can get uh, the neutron flux distribution in this infinite slab reactor. But actually infinite slab is very much an idealization because practical reactors can't have infinite stre stretch rather they are having only finite size. So, uh, in the next lecture or in the last lecture for this fourth module we shall be discussing about different reactors of finite stretch where we shall be taking finite uh, sphere as the finite sphere and finite cylinders as the two geometries and we shall be de developing corresponding expressions for neutron flux density intensity and also we shall be trying to compare different kinds of reactors that are available. Yes. So, for uh, today I would like to close it here itself please revise this lectures and we shall be taking it forward for proper reactor design in the next one. Thank you.